This Harvard grad and former vice president product management at Facebook has a very different vision for the future of digital assistants. Please welcome the co-founder of Finn, Sam Lesson. Hello. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to start with a pop quiz. Does anyone know who that man is? Anyone? No? All right. Well, that is Claude Shannon. And in a lot of ways, he's the real reason that all of these industries exist that exist today, all the way from the technology and computers we use all the way through the services. Yeah, I would actually argue he's probably the most important person of the century that almost no one has heard of. Um, as the father of information theory, he is standing here with a mouse. And that mouse um, is named Theseus. And he was a pretty playful guy. Um, I didn't put a, guy, a picture of a guy with a mouse up here to start for no reason, though. Theseus was actually, in 1952, a mouse that could run through mazes and find a piece of cheese. This is child's play in 2017. No one is impressed by this in this room. But in 1952, it was actually a really big deal. It was so much so that Popular Science published an article called the mouse, this, the, this Mouse is Smarter Than You Are. Um, Time featured it. Um, there were literally conferences, very highfalutin conferences, about the theory of AI that were featuring this mouse that could run through a maze. So just 65 years ago, this was state of the art, and this was really exciting. And we look back on this, and we say it's kind of a joke um, in retrospect. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because when you think about bots, when you think about conversational interfaces, it is hard to not think about the traditional hype curve. And I think it's important to start by level setting that actually there's a strong argument that we are on a hype cycle for AI that is literally going to go over an entire century, starting in the 1950s when things like Theseus were making headlines all the way through the 2020s where hopefully we're making some real progress. Within that meta-hype curve, there are lots of sub-hype curves. So we can talk about algorithmic trading as something that had its own hype curve, image recognition, bots, self-driving cars. These things all fit on this kind of meta-structure that we're working through. So let's talk specifically about bots and conversational interfaces. It is hard to not think that when you think about 2015 or 16, we had a moment of hype. We had a moment of incredible excitement about these interfaces. It is hard to also not believe that in 2016 and 17, we're facing somewhat of a reality check. And my hope, the reason they invited me to this conference, is I actually do believe that we're going to move into a curve where we're really going to see a real path forward after that kind of boom and bust of hype. So let's talk about each of these stages. First, the excitement. Why do we care about these things? Why are these things interesting at all? Well, the first reason, and I think the most important reason, is consumers really want this. And they've really wanted it for a really long time. So there's a few frameworks you can use for this. One is you can look at science fiction. So many science fictions of the last hundred, they all feature this idea of an assistant, someone who works with you, that can understand you really well, understand the world around you, and helps you get more done and lead a better life. Right? This is not a new theme. And usually when you see something recurring in science fiction over and over and over, it's worth paying attention to. Simultaneously, you can think about the real world we inhabit now. You, know, you can look at the medical profession. You can look at you know, the chief of staff to the president. Uh, you can look at what it means to have great executive assistants. There are so many great examples in real world of people using these agents. And then we all know what this feels like to actually use. When I want to make a travel request or do something, I don't want to say exactly what flight. I want to say, I need to be in New York on Thursday and Friday. I'm working from, from home. On, if getting back, get me back to San Francisco on Sunday. Done. Like, we all know that's what we want. Simultaneously, not just consumers, designers want this to happen. This is a pretty good manifestation of our current digital landscape. Our apps are full of little buttons. Those little buttons you click on, and they have lots of little buttons in them. It's really quite a nightmare to use. It is not a seamless experience. Businesses obviously also want this to happen. They want it to happen because distribution has gotten increasingly difficult. They want it to happen because they want to get closer to their customers, and they want it to happen because they want to grow. So everyone's excited. And all of a sudden, it kind of looks possible. You have a great story about big data, not only existing, but the way we can use it well, and technologies like Amazon Redshift, TensorFlow, lots of great platforms coming out there to make sense of all the data. I can't underestimate, personally, the impact of Echo uh, hitting the market in terms of people getting excited. 
And of course, with the exception of Netflix, we can see that basically the entire group of FANG companies have really deep interest in pushing an agenda and pushing around conversational interfaces, either by selling for selling more hardware or to sell more ads. So that's how you get this kind of moment of hype. But we kind of hit a reality check, right, in terms of actually producing these. And it starts with the fact that the consumer experience on these is, by and large, and I'm sure someone here will take issue with this, pretty terrible. Doesn't actually work. So much so, I thought this was funny. Last night when I checked into the hotel, I got a text, which I was excited about, automatically. I said, good morning, Mr. Listen, not my name. Welcome to the diplomat, da 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 Thank you. I said, great. I asked for a question. I kind of could use a haircut in the morning. What can I, can I, can I get a haircut in the morning? And I got back 20 minutes later. I, I apologize. Our concierge is not here. Please call them. I clearly don't want to call them tomorrow to get a recommendation. Like, this is not the future we've been promised. And again, that's with no disrespect to Carly or anyone else who worked on it. It's great that we're doing this directionally. There are design problems. So um, who's here has heard of the cold start problem? Well, it's basically just as hard to interface with a blank text field as it is with a bunch of buttons. It's actually harder in a lot of ways. And so we need new design paradigms to make this stuff work. These, this is not really an improvement yet. Um, and again, you have this problem, which is you can only do things once, right? So again, like you have a really big challenge to overcome from a design perspective. Data problems. We do have a lot of data, but it's really important to understand that the medium is the message, is the data set. If you were to ask the Alexa team, they would probably tell you that most of what humans want to do at home is listen to music. That's not because it's true. It's because that's what they can do and therefore what the data yields, right? So to be really careful of the data we actually have. And there are end problems. Like, it's very difficult to understand how to test, how to build non-deterministic systems, right, where A plus B doesn't equal C. I guess it doesn't in real life either. There are also obviously business problems, which is no one really has quite figured out how to monetize these things, how to make the ecosystem economically work. So I would argue, again, we just went through a period which was a little bit depressing. Let's talk about the path forward, because this has to have a happy ending, and I certainly believe it does. I spend a lot of time on this. Um, one, I would say there is real industry stories that make a lot of sense, and I think there's no question that the travel industry is a particularly compelling case around uh, what it means to use digital assistance and to have them, and it's for a few reasons. One, travel's really complicated. There's a lot of preferences. Things change dynamically. Um, there's very well good data and well-structured data, but it's very nuanced. And it's also very valuable, right? And so you think about what are going to be the leading industries where this happens first and is really meaningful. It makes sense that travel is a big opportunity, and it is today as it was before. Now, it's also worth noting it's very high stakes. Um, at our company, when we do travel uh, arrangements for people or have to interface with travel, we're, we have actually extra layers that we put in place for it because when you make a mistake on someone's travel booking, it's not the like, cute error where you called someone the wrong name. You are truly changing their day or even their week. So it's a very high stakes game to be playing um, despite a good one. The second thing that I think is really important to understand from the past forward beyond industry specificity is what a bot is. Bots are not pure AI anytime soon. They're not going to be. Um, they're also, for the record, not just rehashes of call centers. Um, what I believe the future is and where we're going, what we're, we invest in, and I believe a lot of other people should be, is effectively what we talk about as AAI, or artificial artificial intelligence. Um, and what artificial artificial intelligence is is this. This is like, these are, I pulled these from our app. Um, so these are real requests going through. Are there any gyms in Kauai that have weightlifting equipment prefer near Princeville? Uh, all I can see is yoga studio with cardio classes, nothing like 24-hour fitness. Um, what are some Zika-free beach destinations that will have warm weather over on New Year's, trying to find somewhere relatively close? Bermuda is greater than Bali. Like, these are real requests phrased in real human ways, and we can fulfill them. And I think that's a really valuable thing to be able to do. How you get there, though, is really important. And the metaphor I'll use for this is the first industrial revolution in steam power. So think about making a shoe. It used to be that if you wanted to make a shoe, pre-industrial revolution, you'd have a cobbler. They'd each do it in a kind of different way and make their own shoes. And they were bespoke. They probably weren't very well measured. You moved into a factory. In a factory, you still have people doing lots of things. But the work follows a production line. It's measured. It's understood. Machines do what machines are good at, and people do what people are good at. And you're able to split up the work into those domains. And so when I think of what comes in the next few years that is really powerful, it's machines doing machine work and people doing human work, and a move towards services which are far superior than tech alone. That allows us to be cheaper, faster, and better at serving people in real role cases. So 
when you interact with Finn, and I think ideally I hope a lot of other agents in, in, in the world going forward, it's like having a chief of staff, right? It's like having a great assistant. It is that experience that people want from the future, but behind the scenes, that's backed up by machine learning and a lot of technology and a lot of people, both of those things. <clears throat> so what does the technology end up actually being? It's different than when you're trying to build a pure AI or a pure a solution end to end. You have to focus on specific verticals where technology gives you dramatic leverage over what people can do on their own. One is customization. So every single person has an incredible nuanced set of things that they want and how they interact. What we do, and what I think is the kind of next state of the art, is looking at contacts, calendar, and email, understanding your interaction history, contextual learning, which allows actually a machine, uh, computers, to surface the contextually right information to service any given customer far better than an individual could on their own, even one that just worked for you. The second, which is really important, is effectively understanding how to regulate the flow of tasks and their requirements. Not all tasks are equally urgent, right? You actually can smooth a lot of them. Um, different things have different times they're gonna take to complete. You have to understand supply and demand metrics. Again, for those of you that have worked in and around human populations and call centers, maybe some of this stuff isn't super surprising, but machine learning does take it to the next level and allow you to do some very magical things. And the third thing is understanding if a task is done correctly. This sounds rudimentary, but it's actually extremely difficult in non-deterministic systems to know that once something is completed, it was completed well, efficiently, on time, et cetera, and be able to predict what's going to fail and why it's going to fail. In that whole matrix, you ultimately have people. And people, for the very long future, many, many years, are going to be the thing that's driving understanding, empathy, asking the right questions, and obviously how to fail gracefully. So when you use Finn, and I think a lot of the bots that I mean, you can use it today, but there are other ones out there that I think are pretty good, and you say something like, I need to be in New York Thursday AM and Friday for work and home Saturday as early as possible, hotel thanks, which is an unprocessable request in and of itself, as currently phrased by any system out there, we can say, OK, these are the kind of core properties. This is how long, this is what we need to do. We have all the preferences, and we're able to respond, great, I booked JetBlue flight 15 uh, to JFK, 16 back. Mint both ways. You're staying at 11, Howard. By the way, I got you a high floor room because the subway runs under it. It rattles on low floors. Everything's in your calendar. Everything's on your business Amex. Done. Right? That is the experience, and that is what we can provide. What I hope comes next, and what we're working towards, and would love to work with people in this audience towards, is what happens when these things become a network. Because no service can be perfect on its own. No, nothing can, can exist in a vacuum. The key is how do we build an ecosystem where value can be exchanged, almost a new form of, of value exchange, where services like these, AAI services, can service customers, but then leverage other AAI services and data streams to create better experiences. No one has all the knowledge. No one has all of it. The value becomes the network over time. So that's kind of a vision of where we're going in the not too distant future. I want to look close by, by putting up a few just bullet points of, of review of how I see things playing out soon. One, let's all acknowledge we've been through a hype cycle. This is not the time to give up. Two, we can make magical consumer experiences today. This is not out of our reach. We just have to be a little bit more creative and think a little bit more like services and less like pure technology. Third, which is the important point, machines alone are not going to get us there. You absolutely need to build mixed intelligence services if you want to provide great customer experiences. Caveat, they're really hard to build. <laughs> um, these services must exist in a network of real value exchange for them to make any sense. You need to be able to pay money and value needs to flow, not just data in order for a new version of this type of collaboration to work and for us to be able to build great experiences long term. So you should be informed by the past and not beholden to it. And I really believe, and this is an important point, that we should be striving to create great jobs along with great tech. One of the beauties of things like AAI is you really can have people focus on the most human, human work. And that creates great new types of jobs for people, which I think is an important thing to be keeping in mind these days. So in closing, my hope is that we're right now playing out this little bump. We're playing out a hype cycle, and it's going to take a lot of hard work for us to get through it. 
But if and as we get through it, the good news is, is that not only do we get to build some great services for people, not only do we get to do some really good in the world and create a new experience where more people have access to great assistance in all sorts of forms, but we are playing out this longer Shannon-esque curve on AI where bots is a really interesting piece of a much longer storyline about how we create intelligent machines. Thank you.